Good morning. Uh, hello and welcome to the Daily Bible Reading Show. We're looking at Psalm 40 today. Uh, let me pray and then we'll look at Psalm 40. Uh, Lord, help me to make this psalm my prayer, my cry of help, of salvation, but also a call of praise to you. Uh, help me to use these words to uh, plant them deeply in my heart and help me to be clear, to be encouraging to whoever is listening right now. I pray this in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. So we are looking at Psalm 40. Hello and welcome to the Daily Bible Reading Show. We are live on Instagram. No one's watching, that's fine, <laughs> but you probably will see this later as a recording. But just to know that this is live, so all kinds of stuff can happen. So Psalm 40 for the director of music of David, a psalm, verse 1, I waited patiently for the Lord. He turned to me and heard my cry. He lifted me out of the slimy pit, out of the mud and mire. He set my feet on a rock and gave me a firm place to stand. He put a new song in my mouth, a hymn of praise to our God. Many will see and fear and put their trust in the Lord. So, okay, uh, we're, we're reading Psalm 40, by the way, and David uh, begins uh, by talking about why he is singing this psalm. And he says, you know, verse three, God put this new song in my mouth. So it's almost as if God gave him the inspiration to write this psalm, to sing this praise. But it comes out of a place of salvation. You know, verse one, I waited for God patiently, and then he lifted me up. Uh, it's an analogy for how God has saved him. And so this song, or this psalm, or what he calls a new song, it's his response to salvation. It's almost as if David is saying, you know, I can't help but write this song or sing this song because God has done this amazing thing. He saved me. And this is just a response. This is just instinctive for me to say this, to sing this. Um, uh, in front of the church, you know, verse three, many will see in fear. So he's singing this, he's praising God in front of others. Verse four, blessed is the man who makes the Lord his trust, who does not look to the proud, to those who turn aside to false gods. Many, O Lord, my God, are the wonders you've done, the things you planned for us. No one can recount to you were I to speak and tell of them, they would be too many to declare. So he seems to contrast what he's doing now, you know, praising God and saying, no, too many things <laughs> to, to tell you about God and uh, who he is and what he's done. But he contrasts what he's doing now in terms of that praise with those who aren't praising God. And why are they praising God? Why aren't they giving thanks to God? It's because verse four, they are proud and they turn aside to false gods. And this might mean that, you know, God, and you might think that, oh, God didn't save them. Uh, but it's more the sense that they've turned aside to other gods to save them. They've turned to themselves. Um, some, uh, some translations have falsehood. They've turned to different ways of lifting themselves out of this situation where they're stuck, where they need help. Instead of turning to God, They've turned to their own strength. They've turned to other gods. They've turned to other devices to save them from that situation. And so in their case, maybe that's why they're not giving praise to God because they don't see their need for God and they've not experienced this salvation from God. Verse six, so sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but my ears you have pierced. You have pierced, I think, um, opened verse six. Um, my footnote says you can also think of it as God digging through his ears. Uh, burnt offerings and sin offerings you did not require. Then I said, here I am. I have come. It is written about me in the scroll. I desire to do your will. Oh my God, your law is written in my heart. So he is talking about worship. You know, sacrifice and offering, that's uh, literally what you would do in the temple. You'd offer up an animal 
piece of meat, and that would be worship. That would be the offering, the sacrifice that you would offer up to God. You know, today you go to church, you think worship is singing a song, but no, no, no. You know, back in the Old Testament times, you can't appear before God empty handed. You had to bring the sacrifice. It would cost you something and something would die. This animal would be this offering, this sacrifice. But interestingly, in terms of this kind of definition of worship, verse six, he says, that's not what God wants. Sacrifice and offering you, God, you didn't ask for this, or rather you don't really want this. What you want rather is for me to hear your word, verse six, my ears you pierced. And that's the idea of God then digging through his ear, clearing the canal so that everything God says goes straight into his ears, straight into his heart, straight into his life. In, in other words, what God wants more than your praise or even your sacrifice is your obedience to hear him, to obey him, to love him in his word. Again, burnt offerings and sin offerings, verse six, you did not require, it's not something that we do, but it's a response to what God has done. He saved us and therefore we praise him. And that's what the Psalms allow us to do. It's God's word that enables us to respond to God's salvation. But then something else is written in this word, you know, this Psalm, you know, this, 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 this word that God has given him because verse seven, he says, here I am, I've come because it's written about me in the scroll. I think the scroll perhaps referring to uh, God's word again, you know, in the Old Testament in the past, you know, in the synagogue, you know, the, the, the books of the prophets were written in scrolls. Uh, actually, in yesterday's uh, reading, I didn't do this, Ezekiel chapter three, uh, Ezekiel ate a scroll in a vision that he had. And again, it's that picture of internalizing God's word. But here he says he's turning up before God because somehow as he's reading God's word, he says, it's written about me. <laughs> it, 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 it's kind of weird. It's almost as if you're reading the Bible and it's telling you about God. But then as you read God's word, God is speaking to you directly from his word. And God is calling you to appear before him. And therefore he says, okay, all right, okay. This is like an appointment that God has set for me to appear before him. And he says, okay, here I am. I'm turning up because you've called me in your word. And he says, verse eight, I desire to do your will. Oh my God, your law is written inside of my heart. Verse nine, I proclaim righteousness in the great assembly. I do not seal my lips as you know, O Lord. I do not hide your righteousness in my heart. I speak of your faithfulness and salvation. I do not conceal your love and your truth from the great assembly. And so he keeps saying, I don't do this, I don't do this. And what is it that he doesn't do? He doesn't hide his praise. He doesn't hide God's word. You know, he says, I do not conceal your love and your truth, but he doesn't hide it from his brothers and sisters in church, from the great assembly. And so here again, you know, the context of the Psalm is David saying, let me tell you why I'm praising God today. Why I have so much to say about him. You know, he saved me, you know, he's done so many good things in my life. But there is a kind of a teaching aspect to his praise as well. He's not concealing this. He is meant to speak this in a clear way, in a forthright way in front of the great assembly. Twice he says, verse nine and verse 10, this great assembly, meaning it's almost his duty to praise God as he comes before other people, not just for God's sake, not even for his own sake, you know, for his own faithfulness, but for the sake of the brothers and the sisters around them. It's interesting to think that as we praise God, as we come together as his people, there is a kind of a building up aspect whereby it affects the people around us who hear us praising God. There's, a, there's, there's, there's something in which they hear in our praise that tells them about God's love and God's truth, verse 10. And that's amazing that God would use us, use our praise and save us in order that we might reveal through our praise, his character, his love, his truth to the people around us. And that's why he doesn't hold back from singing, from worshiping, from declaring God's truth when, especially when he is amongst his brothers and sisters in church. Verse 11, 
Now, just to say that the second half, verse 11, is kind of like a turning point. Because up to this point, you know, he is very positive. He's praising God. He said, God has saved him and declaring your praises before, before all my brothers and sisters, the great congregation. But verse 11, suddenly the switch flips and it becomes very personal between the psalmist and God. Here, verse 11, do not withhold your mercy from me, O Lord. May your love and your truth always protect me. For my troubles without number surround me, my sins have overtaken me, and I cannot see. They are more than the hairs of my head, and my heart fails within me. And this idea of this number, in verse 12, the troubles without number, that's so many of my troubles right now. I mean, he was just praising God. He said, oh, God, you know, I have so many troubles. And he talks about his sins. There are so many sins. And these sins are more than the hairs on my head. Like, There's so much that I'm grappling with inside my sin, grappling with outside the troubles that assail me. And you contrast this number of these troubles, if you look back to the page, um, uh, many, verse 5, many other wonders you've done for us. No one can recount for them. There are too many to declare. So verse 5, so many wonders. Verse 11 and verse 12, so many troubles. It's such a contrast. He was just talking about how good God is, how amazing God is. I can't tell you how many of them because there are too many. And he says, how terrible my troubles are. <laughs> how serious my sin is. There are too many to tell you about that. And there's this, and therefore, this tension between what he says about God, which is true, and what he experiences about his own life, his own sin, his own struggles. And that is true as well. There's something very authentic about that. That someone who is willing to be open and honest about his experience with God, but also his experience of his own fallenness and brokenness inside of him. Verse 13, be pleased, O Lord, to save me. O Lord, come quickly to help me. May all who seek to take my life be put to shame and confusion. May all who desire my ruin be turned back in disgrace. May those who say to me, aha, aha, <laughs> be appalled at their own shame. But may all who seek you rejoice and be glad in you. May those who love your salvation always say, the Lord is exalted. And it's worth again contrasting again. Earlier on, we saw the contrast between those who praise God and those who don't. And those who don't are those who are trying to seek their own God, seek their own salvation. But those who praise God are those who experience God's salvation. And we have that same kind of reflection here in verses 13 to 16. Those who are trying to attack David. Remember, David is the king. And so they're attacking him because they sense that he is in trouble. He is weak. This is a time to strike. They say, aha, aha, look at you. You know, now is the time for us to bow you know, to, to take revenge against you. But the opposite of that, now, if you notice that this is a very personal attack, isn't it? If you, if you ever have someone who really hates your guts, who's really out to take revenge upon you, what's the opposite of that kind of enemy, that kind of hatred? You would think the opposite of that is someone who then loves you, someone who stands by your side, someone who fights your fight for you. But it doesn't say that. See, the opposite of all these enemies who are coming to verse 14, take my life, who are try trying to desire my ruin, who are saying, aha, aha to me, is not people who say, well done, well done, praise God, praise God, or you're so good, David. No, he says the opposite of that is those who rejoice and are glad in God, in you. May those who love your salvation say that the Lord ex is exalted. And so you see the opposite of someone who then, um, well, put it this way, you know, sometimes when we go through tough times, we are looking for friends. We want people who will encourage us, who will be with us. But actually what we really need are people who trust in God, who look to God. In other words, you need to surround yourself with people who themselves are praising God. You know, earlier on we were saying that my praise can affect the people around me. They hear me praising God and therefore they will praise God as well. Well, I need that as well. When I come to church, I come to hear the praises of God, your praises 
affect me as well as I'm going through trouble. You might not even know that I'm going through this trouble, but simply by hearing you say, verse 16, the Lord is exalted. Simply by seeing how glad you are to see God, you're rejoicing in Him and that you love His salvation. You yourself have experienced God's goodness and God's saving grace. When I see that even from afar, I am helped in my troubles that you may not see, but God sees, but then God helps me through your praise, through your experience of salvation. And so the last verse, verse 17, yet I am poor and needy. May the Lord think of me. You are my help and my deliverer. Oh my God, do not delay. And he ends by confessing that he's still in trouble. He's still calling out to God to help him. Such a difference from the way it began. He says, you know, I'm going to start out by praising you. I'm going to think back to the time that you saved me. But he ends up by saying, you know, right now, right here, I'm in trouble. I'm still waiting for God to help me. And that's oftentimes the experience of the Christian, the now and the not yet. Now I am you know, still struggling, I'm still waiting, but in the time to come, He will save me. I will sing of His praises now, of His salvation then. I will sing of my God's um, uh, goodness and His grace now when I'm still you know, looking and waiting for Him because He has already saved me in the past and He will save me eventually through His promises and through His goodness and just His, just his nature as God, my Savior. Now, just to end, um, uh, I cannot but point to Hebrews chapter 10 because in verse 7, it's, it's a direct reference that Hebrews chapter 10 makes to Jesus. Verse 7 again in Psalm 40, it says, Here I am, uh, I have come, it is written about me in the scroll. And, you know, you turn through the scroll, you turn through the Bible, you don't see the name Calvin there. <laughs> I mean, it's not that this is directly speaking to you, but it is speaking about someone who was in trouble, who trusted in God, and God heard him, and God made him a sacrifice. And this is Hebrews chapter 10, applying Psalm 40 towards Jesus. Let me see Hebrews chapter 10, uh, verse 5. Therefore, when Christ came into the world, he said, Sacrifice and offering you did not desire, but a body you prepared for me. With burnt offerings and sin offerings you were not pleased. Then I said, Here I am. It is written about me in the scroll. I have come to do your will. And the whole context of this, I won't go into it, is talking about how the worship of the temple, something needing to die in order for you to be forgiven, all that is put aside because the true offering of sacrifice, of worship, was given in the Lord Jesus Christ. All of the Bible, what is written in the scroll, scroll points forward to Jesus offered up on the cross in obedience to God's word, that he might be our sacrifice and that he might be our praise. And so the times when we find it really, really hard to praise God, the times when we find it really, really hard to experience God's salvation, we only need to look to Jesus, to his obedience, his once for all sacrifice and death for us on the cross to see there our sure and certain hope that God has saved us, God will save us in the end, and even right now, God is sanctifying us. God is cleansing us. God is digging that hole through our ear such that the word of the gospel comes into our minds, into our hearts, into our lives, that we might trust in him right now, that we might praise in him right now, that he might deliver us from the mire and from the mud and put us on solid ground, that we might stand, sing that new song to God and trust in him with all of our lives. Heavenly Father, thank you so much for Jesus, for his obedience and his sacrifice on the cross. And help us, Lord, during times when, you know, it's hard to trust in you, to trust in him, to look to him and his obedience and to see there the certain hope and salvation that was purchased by Jesus on the cross. We thank you and praise you in Jesus' name. Amen. <music>